Welcome to my little video session here. I'm going to paint a picture in a minute, uh, impressionistically, hopefully. Uh, there are a lot of principles in Impressionism that I've learned over the years. Uh, I studied with a, an Impressionist teacher who studied with an Impressionist teacher who was, who was a student of William Mary Chase, who brought a lot of ideas uh, over from Europe at a time when Impressionism was being talked about in the cafes in Paris and Berlin. And a lot of the things that they talked about are not necessarily something that someone would learn outside of that line of tutelage. Um, I've been doing it now since 1970, and um, I taught classes in the parks in New Orleans for years, um, Impressionism, and the ways that we perceive nature. Uh, Impressionism has been touted as a way of painting, uh, whereas without the ways of perception, uh, we wouldn't have that way of painting, because it was the perception that needed to be painted and the technique evolved from the necessity um, that, you know, that you can't paint what is an impression uh, in a long studio piece. Um, your memory fades, there's nothing there. The exhilaration of the, you know, of the uh, uh, setting and the lighting and everything is lost. And um, that's why an impression of the thing is, um, uh, is it requires a specific, um, not methodology, but it requires specific um, information. Um, information about how something looks in relationship to something else, primarily. Um, impressionism is the study of relationships. And it came at a time when um, relationships were not the vogue. In other words, there was an absolute. This is what it is and everything um, is, is, you know, it, it, that's just what it is. Um, whereas now, you know, we, we are accustomed to thinking that, oh, that's the way you perceive it, that's the way you see it. But in the past, that was not always so. Um, absolutism uh, you know, is still uh, rampant uh, among people who insist that something is this way and it doesn't matter how you see it, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, and, um, and, and so, so I'm, about, I'm just about to, uh, do a second stage thing here. That is, I'm just gonna take these colors to the edge. I'll mix some medium with it and I'll stir it around until I get most of the white out except for the one spot that I want to be white, which is right there. Everything else should be down from that. Um, well, here we are for day two. Um, I touched it up a bit and got the whites out for the most part, except for the little rim around here, I left that. Um, but every, all the other whites are out and so we can see now that, uh, you know, we take another shot at making the colors true. The first shot that you take is limited by the fact that all the colors are put on while the canvas is white. So once that is not an obstacle any longer, you go back and you can actually make really worthwhile adjustments. Um, and so that's what we're gonna to try to do today. But symmetrical objects like bowls always uh, are, and, and vases too are always a problem. And so uh, it's difficult to get those right. So you see a lot of niggling and and this sort of thing. And in the end, uh, you know, hopefully it will look okay in the end, so. One of the ways that we break that um, crystallization of mind is by teaching someone that the color that you see is not necessarily the color um, that is there that something like a spectroscope or a machine would note. And uh, I can show that on the computer uh, by, by showing that what shows up as a gray in a photograph on the computer is actually quite visible as a purple. And that purple, depending on what color it's seen next to, will turn into a green. If you have a, a white next to, this is what I intend to show, is that a white uh, next to yellow will appear purplish because it assumes the complement of the yellow. And a white seen next to red will turn green. And that's because green is the complement of red. Um, neutrals take on the complement of the color that they're seen next to. And this rule was um, established by Chevre, uh, uh, Michel, Michel Chevreul, uh, around 1839 um, in France. And uh, the Impressionists made use of this. Um, it, what his rule states is that the complement of a bright color will bleed into the next color close to it. And what he meant by bleed into, of course, is that that other color will assume the complement of that bright color. 
And the reason being for that um, is that it, the separation of colors is important for survival. You need to be able to see um, colors clearly in opposition to other colors. And so uh, there's a program in your brain which does that for you. And what appears to naturally be a purple, if seen next to another color, will naturally, to you, assume to be a green. And we don't even question it. We just think, oh, that's a purple shadow. But if we saw it next to another color, it would be a green shadow. And, um, and it's, it's not something that the camera picks up so readily. Uh, anyway, I intend to show that in another, another video. Uh, but in this one, I want, to, uh, I want to examine what happens with uh, three whites uh, in a setup. Um, the setup that I have back here has got a white checks on the tabletop, a white bowl, and a white backdrop. Uh, the white bowl is yellowish. The backdrop back there is, um, is, is pretty much just a white without a, a tendency uh, that I can, you know, that, that... In other words, what I'm going to have to do before I paint this is that I'm going to have to decide which color to make each of these whites. Um, and to separate them, to make that white appear to be that white instead of the other one, then I will choose a different color to go with each one. And I've already decided I will choose yellow for the bowl. But I have not decided on the backdrop color. The color of the white on the tabletop here will be a violet of some sort, a blue violet most likely. But they're all so light that the, the change within them is slight on the palette. Now, if we perceive these um, colors uh, as neutrals, then they are grays in our vision. But if we perceive them as a color, then, and we separate the colors with no neutrals in our end up painting, it's all going to be a color that tends in, a, in, a, in the direction of a hue, um, and, uh, the hue of, of yellow or the hue of red. Um, and so the, um, the, the, the end result will end up showing more light um, than you would if it was strictly uh, a tonal piece, uh, not taking these perceptual matters into account. Um, and that was what was discovered by Monet and Pizarro and Renoir when they went out to paint the landscape in the 1860s. They had gone and on to see Camille Corot. I can, um, I can stroke it in, like I've stroked a few strokes here. Uh, the roughness uh, of, of, the, of putting the strokes on, um, it, it creates an effect, a uh, broken color, where you have uh, the colors mixing from a distance um, instead of close up. Now we're all familiar with the idea, but how do you apply broken color so that that actually works? Well, first you come up with a color approximation of how close you, how, how, you first come up with an approximation of the color that you think it is. And then once everything is up there and you get the chance to see it all at one time, that's when you make the adjustments and the broken color at that point can be used to great advantage because instead of like re-blending everything, I don't want to re-blend everything, I just want to drop a color on top of that that will, at a distance, change it because it's a different color. And so I'm gonna to attempt to do that uh, in these, and uh, we'll just see. Um, there's, uh, uh, the colors are pretty dry, and uh, let's just see how this goes. Papa Corot. He was an old painter that liked the young painters, and they came to, for him, to, uh, to him for advice. And, um, and he told them, go out in the forest before sunrise and watch what happens around you and you will see something that happens and paint that, paint your impression of what you see. Not what the scene is with trees and a sunset that one would imagine uh, and, and you could paint in your studio from notes that you took. change this background and we use a little broken color to do it with and I'm going to mix up a, a color I'm just basically going to put this green in this yeah this red in this in this here okay, because they're compliments anyway and um, just kind of a, a quick thing here yeah that's dried up um, so I'm going to mix up a pink It already has a bit of green in there, so it's already muting it. And this is um, this is to go on this side. It's way too dark. Okay. All right, just work there. That's gonna be fine. What I'm gonna try. 
try to do is put some marks that will make this a green disappear. off the bristles. That. That's kind of nice, but it's better if we go cadmium red deep. That'll create a little further. This orange, cadmium vermilion would be orange, vermilion, and then cadmium red deep would be the the, the um, procession of colors, uh, whereas I decided to go because the vermilion looked a little too orangey. Um, I wanted it to because here we got a purple, so the intermediate between the orange and the purple is going to be first to be the vermilion, but that's close to the orange, then it'd be the cadmium red deep, which is closer to the purple, and so that's more of a medium color. So that's the reason it didn't look as good when I started to put it up there, is that this is going to look better, more harmonious than the. Uh, and the vermilion would have been anyway. So, um, and I can actually go ahead and do a vermilion in between the two uh, to get that other thing I was talking about that creates harmony. It's um, it rains down on the, the piece that way, um, which makes me want to make this. First flash was something that the impressionists wanted to paint and in order to do it they had to work quickly and, and when you work quickly and you throw paint up and you look at the scene quickly what you see is you see the entire scene you see the relationships if there are three reds you see all three reds at the same time and you know which one is brighter and which one is pinker which one is orange same with all of the colors and so um, the, the the technique of applying color quickly once it's done a few times and you step back, I'm sure that in the artist studios and in galleries and what have you, when they would put one of these pictures up and everybody walks in and say, oh my God, this is so realistic. And then they walk up to it and it's nothing but marks of paint. Um, and that was the start of something extremely exciting that impressionism began. At that point, people realized that a, a salon painting next to that impressionist piece was dull and unlifelike and didn't carry the actual stimulation stimulation that being on the scene carried. That was what Van Gogh was so good at, was he didn't settle for a flat sky. He put strokes in the sky and made patterns, and he made it the sky exciting because the sky is exciting, and a flat color does not carry that excitement. It carries the color of it, and you know that the sky is there, but it's not skyish. And Van Gogh saw that, and, and he amplified it, you know, many-fold. So that's what we're looking for, is we're looking for a way to see more than just the analyzed vision of what's there. And if it sounds like I'm analyzing quite a lot in order to do that, well, that's true. I had to analyze a lot in order to organize this video that I want to do. And I hope that a lot of what I said will be, uh, be visible at the end of this project. Um, anyway, thanks. <laughs>